Hi everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started with our presentation today. My name is Caitlin Bergstrom. I'm the Public Affairs Analyst with AGU and we are very excited to welcome Augusta Wilson to give this presentation today. Augusta is an attorney with the Climate Science Legal Defense Fund um, and she'll be talking about legal issues for scientists in electoral politics today. Some quick housekeeping items. There is a Q&A box um, in the GoToWebinar panel. So any questions that you have throughout the presentation, please plug those into the Q&A box and we will have a dedicated Q&A section um, at the end. And we'll also get to some of the questions that you all submitted um, with your registration. So Augusta, want to take it away? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Um, and thank you, Caitlin. As, as Caitlin just mentioned, I am a lawyer with a nonprofit group uh, called Climate, uh, Climate Science Legal Defense Fund. And uh, we, we really do a, a whole range of things. And I wanted to start by just taking a, a second to um, describe for everybody a little bit the context that I'm I'm coming from. We primarily um, directly work with and represent uh, scientists, as our name suggests, especially climate scientists, but scientists of all stripes uh, who are finding themselves being targeted, uh, harassed, attacked because of the work that they do. Um, and we offer pro bono representation um, for those scientists. And we also, um, you know, another really important part of our work is uh, trying to provide uh, resources, uh, written resources and things like this webinar to scientists about, you know, sort of important issues uh, that scientists are facing. And one that is um, particularly uh, pressing and, and frequent at this moment as we we are in the height of a general election season uh, is how scientists can be more politically engaged and what kinds of legal issues can potentially arise for scientists who wish to uh, engage um, in political activity with electoral politics. Um, so uh, the goal of the presentation today is to um, talk a little bit about what some of those um, most common uh, issues are and things that scientists should be aware of. Um, you know, as, as many of you I'm sure know, um, this is a time when scientists, uh, both as individuals and in organizations, various kinds of scientific organizations, um, have really felt compelled to engage in politics in a way that they have not before. Um, I, I have up here just a, a snapshot of Scientific American giving a, a little bit ago its first ever um, endorsement of a presidential candidate in, in its entire history. There have been, you know, real trends of scientists running for office in numbers that they just never have before. Um, I've seen even from some of the questions that people um, sent in as they registered for this webinar that, you know, there's, there's a, there, there's a real urgency for folks um, to these questions about, you know, how can you know, can I engage in a scientist uh, as a scientist in in the political arena, and and what do I need to be aware of? So that's what we're going to try to cover to some degree today. Um, the the bulk of what I want to chat with you all about, because I think it's the single most important thing for scientists to be aware of if they are considering um, undertaking these kinds of activities, is the Hatch Act. The Hatch Act is the main federal statute that regulates the political activity of federal employees. Um, and importantly though, um, although it does by its own terms um, really only apply to people who are directly employed by the federal government, uh, there are certainly plenty of situations in which even a scientist who's not actually a federal employee, for example, a scientist who has a federal grant, um, maybe is employed by a research university or a, or a lab but has a federal grant, um, there are situations where 
those kinds of grants or contracts or partnership agreements or similar um, actually incorporate by their own terms um, either directly the Hatch Act requirements or very requirements that are very similar to those that are spelled out in the Hatch Act. So even if you are a scientist who's not employed by a federal agency or otherwise a, a federal employee, um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about here can, you know, certainly be relevant. So I, you know, I, my hope is that this is this is useful to to all scientists to sort of think about and understand as guidelines. And the 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 single most important thing that I hope everybody uh, will take away way about the Hatch Act is that although it does impose some restrictions on the political activities of federal employees, and we'll talk in, in uh, some more detail about what those look like, at its very fundamental level um, and right at its very beginning, it, it, it really strongly supports the notion that federal employees should absolutely have the right to engage pretty fully um, in the political sphere as private citizens. Um, and so that's, you know, that's the most important thing to, to remember. There are certain guidelines and restrictions, but the Hatch Act is not something that means that if you are a federal employee or you have a federal grant or you otherwise interact in any way with the federal government that you cannot um, engage in, in politics. It, it really does actually, uh, quite to the contrary, support the right to do that. So let's let's start by talking a little bit um, further. I mean, I started to talk about it, but going a little bit more depth about who actually needs to be concerned with Hatch Act restrictions and how is it set up, who who does it govern, and what does that look like? Um, so as I mentioned, you know, pretty broad application to people who are employed by the federal government, and it, it can even go outside that sphere. What it does, um, or the way it's been interpreted, I should say, really, is to to break the employees it covers into two basic groups. Uh, one is called less restricted employees and one is generally referred to as further restricted employees. So further restricted employees is a fairly circumscribed group of people. Um, this is not going to be the majority of people. It's a, it's a relatively select group um, and, and there's quite a lot of, you know, nitty gritty detail in the act itself in terms of exactly who falls into that category. But broadly speaking, um, if you are a scientist whose job involves in some way or another national security issues, um, I could, for example, see someone who worked at Los Alamos National Laboratories um, potentially falling into that category. Another one is election regulation or law enforcement. If you are working in those types of areas, you, you, you may be a further restricted employee. And the other important category that some scientists may fall into that I want to mention is that anyone who is a career appointee in the senior executive service is generally speaking going to be a further restricted employee. But that's, you know, that's sort of it. It's a relative, you know, it's, it's comparatively a pretty small group. And less restricted employees is going to be by definition, everyone else. Anyone who's not a further restricted employee, pretty specifically, you're going to be a less restricted employee. So that's going to be the majority of, of, of scientists. So what actually does the Hatch Act say? What, what restrictions does it impose? Um, and I'm going to start with less restricted employees. And I'm going to apologize in advance because these next couple of slides, I have quite a bit of text here, and, and which I, I'm not going to bore everybody to tears by reading. <laughs> but I have it here because I've taken sort of some of the specific language that's actually in the Act and, and put it up for those who are interested. Um, and I, I I believe that these slides will be available also later should you want to have sort of this detail. But what I'm going to try to do here is just give highlights and, you know, sort of over overviews of, of what is contained in the Hatch Act. So in terms of less restricted employees, the, the major two goals 
the Hatch Act has are one, to make sure that um, federal agencies and offices and programs operate in a way that is nonpartisan and that doesn't appear to be partisan. And the second goal is to make sure that federal employees themselves don't feel sort of bullied or politically coerced at work. Um, and so everything that is contained in the act is, is essentially intended to allow both of those things to happen. And with that in mind, what, what the act does in terms of less restricted employees is essentially to say, you know, you absolutely can engage in a pretty broad and full spectrum of political activity, provided that you don't do it while you are exercising your federal authority while you are exercising the authority of your office um, and that that will help to make sure that there isn't the impression that what you're doing is you know somehow supported by uh, your your employer and also to make sure that you know those uh, other employees around you at work don't feel pressured uh, so as a less restricted employee you absolutely can get involved with a political campaign, uh, volunteer, uh, knocking on doors to try to generate turnout, go to a rally, um, even give a speech at that rally, supporting a candidate, um, put up a sign in support of a, a political candidate or party, as long as you don't do it while you are at work, while you are on duty, while you are wearing your federal uh, uniform or insignia um, in a government building or vehicle or sort of otherwise exercising that authority. That's the really broad contour of it. And um, there are some other specific requirements and you can see a little bit of that here. Um, a couple to mention before moving on are just the one thing the Hatch Act does do for less restricted employees is to say you cannot um, participate in fundraising for political candidates. And it's imp important to note there that when, it, when I say that, what, what I mean is not that um, less restricted employees are prohibited from donating um, their own private funds to a campaign, sending, you know, sending a contribution. It means, you know, really actively participating in fundraising, uh, soliciting donations, hosting a fundraiser, things like that. Um, and the other thing I, I wanted to note specifically from the list is just that it does also prohibit less restricted employees from themselves running for office in a partisan election. And partisan has a pretty particular meaning. It means associated with a political party. Um, so there are, and, and I'll touch on this a, a little bit later too, briefly, but there are certainly elections in which you could run as a nonpartisan candidate. If you were running for the local school board, for example, you might well be doing that in a way where you're not actually affiliated with any party at all in a nonpartisan manner. And as far as the Hatch Act is concerned, that would be just fine. Um, to talk about further restricted employees a little bit, and again, I'm not going to read all of this text to you, but uh, I will just sort of highlight. So further restricted employees are subject to all of the restrictions that I just uh, referenced uh, with respect to uh, less restricted employees and then sort of a host of others. You can you can get a sense here that there's quite a bit of particular detail that I'm going to skate over a little bit because uh, we don't have that much time. But um, is it, the the really broad arc of it is that further restricted employees, unlike less restricted employees, are actually prohibited by the Hatch Act from taking an active part in a political campaign, even as a private citizen. So for that, you know, sort of fairly select circumscribed group of people who are further restricted employees, the Hatch Act does, you know, does do quite a bit to limit uh, how they can participate in politics and get involved with the campaign. And there are some other sort of finicky requirements. For example, further restricted employees are not allowed to act as poll workers and they're not allowed to drive voters to the polls, both of which are things that as private citizens on their own time, less restricted employees certainly would be able to do. 
without having any Hatch Act problems. Um, so I was touching on this a little bit um, before, so I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but um, just to reiterate, you know, not all political activity is partisan. And as in associated with a particular um, political party. And so the Hatch Act is really focused on partisan activities. And there are really a range of, of activities that are political that, that where that would not be the case. Um, I mentioned the school board example. Um, another couple uh, that I brainstormed was, you know, for example, a scientist could um, be actively involved in supporting or opposing a constitutional amendment that did not, you know, was not associated with any particular political party. And that would be a nonpartisan activity that did not uh, trigger Hatch Act concerns. Same would be true for something uh, like a municipal ordinance that was proposed that that's not associated with with either party. Um, all of those would would not only be fine, but would not even trigger Hatch Act uh, considerations. So often, you know, the, the best way, I, I just said a whole lot of words, but often the, the best way to discuss these things, the best way to illustrate really is just with um, some quick case studies. So I wanted to, to do that to talk through a few times that the Hatch Act has surfaced in the news to sort of understand and, and hopefully illustrate how it works and, and how Hatch Act concerns can be triggered. Um, this, as many of you I'm sure know, is Kellyanne Conway, who until recently was a high level White House employee. She was a senior advisor to President Trump. And the Office of Special Counsel actually on multiple occasions put out um, reports saying that she was in sort of a serial way violating the Hatch Act. And how, how did the Office of Special Counsel feel she was doing this? What was it that was causing the problem? So specifically, what they were concerned about was that she was, um, on, on really numerous occasions, giving television interviews and um, making social media posts in which she was denigrating a Democratic candidates for office. And there were a variety of instances. In some cases, it was um, uh, during the presidential primaries, and she was discussing um, Democratic uh, presidential candidates. Uh, in others, she was talking about uh, candidates for Senate. Um, and, and what the Office of Special Counsel said was she has not uh, done anything to, to, to separate these statements from her official role. When she is making these statements um, in television interviews, she's, she's doing the interview in her capacity as a federal employee. And she is, you know, the substance of it is to uh, take a position on a, on a a partisan political campaign, and that is a pretty direct violation of the Hatch Act. And the other thing that I, I felt made this a you know sort of a useful illustration is that social media also came into play here. And um, you know some of what was of concern were uh, tweets, I believe. Um, and so you know there too that you know even if she even if she were at home uh, while she was doing it, if she's using sort of her official uh, account, her official White House account, the account that she runs in her official capacity as a federal employee, um, that can really trigger Hatch Act concerns, and it did. Um, the Office of Special Counsel was pretty worried about it. So that's one example. Um, this picture, uh, folks may recognize also, this is from the Republican National Convention, which took place over the summer, and I'm sure everybody recognizes that building and recalls that a significant chunk of the convention um, took place on the White House lawn. And so, it, interestingly enough, the, the president and the vice president are very experienced explicitly exempted from the Hatch Act. So they they do not have to worry about it. So the fact that the president himself, as you can see in this picture, is there, you know, sort of engaging in political activity, um, that is not a Hatch Act problem because he is exempted. Um, what was of concern to an awful lot of people when when this happened was that 
there surely were a whole number of other federal employees who are not exempted from the Hatch Act who participated in making this happen, um, who in all sorts of ways supported this event, made it possible, made it happen. And by doing that on, you know, on federal property in their federal capacity, um, they were pretty undeniably engaging in political activity um, in, in their official capacities. And there's a big concern that that was sort of a, a, a really widespread Hatch Act violation. It's worth noting that there there is, as I understand it, a little bit of, of genuine disagreement out there uh, about whether um, in a situation like this, when the activity that's in question is happening not actually inside a federal building, because the language is uh, in fact in federal building, but on federal property, not in a building like the White House lawn or, for example, a national park, um, whether that is covered by the Hatch Act. And I, I, I do believe that is a little bit of a gray area. So one of, one of the things these case studies actually illustrate, uh, and the next one really does as well, is that it's not, you know, it's not always uh, crystal clear. There can certainly be some confusion and some complications and, and new situations. And it's a it's a moment for me to mention that if you're a scientist who has a question about your specific situation, you know, hey, I'm I'm facing this. I here's something that's happening specifically to me, or something that I would like to do, and I I, I have a question about whether in my specific situation I need to be worried about the Hatch Act. Um, that is exactly the kind of question that we at CSLDF would be very happy to help you work through. Um, we offer free, completely confidential consultations, and, and, and that's exactly the kind of thing we do for scientists. So if you, if you have a question like that about your specific situation, please don't ever hesitate to reach out to us. I'll have my contact information up at, at the end, and, and of course, you can also find us um, all of that contact info on our website. Um, the last sort of little real world example I, I wanted to talk through a bit, and I wanted to talk through it particularly because to me it illustrates actually a, a, a situation in which um, scientists got I think sort of somewhat unwittingly caught up into a little uh, a little bit of a hatch act brouhaha um, goes back a bit in time. This uh, this is a snapshot from a web, from a website called NASA Watch in 2004 um, when, during the. Uh, the summer of the 2004 presidential campaign, and although his face has been blurred out, that picture is John Kerry, who was the uh, Democratic nominee uh, that year. And as the campaign was going on that summer, John Kerry visited the Kennedy Space Center, NASA's Kennedy Space Center. And as I understand it, there was a little rally at the visitor center and he also did a tour um, of some of the facilities and he had to suit up. Um, and there were a bunch of pictures taken and NASA put those pictures of his visit on a, a NASA website. And in addition to quite a bit of John General Merriman at the time about how John Kerry looked in that suit that he wore for the visit, um, there was there became sort of a, a a real concern that by posting those pictures, um, the NASA employees who did it uh, were were straying into Hatch Act violation territory because there you know this was a political campaign and there was an argument that you know this was participating in partisan political activity. Um, and so this is another example where there was real sort of disagreement that it was not perfectly clear. NASA took the pictures down um, because of Hatch Act concerns and, and you know, as you can see, blurred out and then put them, put some of them back up. Um, so it was, it was, a, it was a bit of a kerfuffle um, and, and the kind of situation that, that can unfortunately arise and that, you know, scientists should, I, I think in general, be on the lookout for, especially, you know, in the midst of really um, crazy campaign seasons like we're in right now. 
so that's that's sort of the Hatch Act overview and, and the highlights of, of what it does and does not do. The other topic that I wanted to cover quickly uh, was First Amendment considerations. And, you know, how does the First Amendment sort of play into a scientist's ability to make a political statement? Um, if that you know, how no, if that scientist is a federal employee or a government employee, and uh, there, this is a really rich area. There is um, a huge amount of case law. It is deep and complicated, and we will be able only to do sort of the most glancing of blows here on on what the First Amendment looks like, but the the gist of it is um, that if a scientist government employee is speaking as a private citizen uh, about a matter of public concern in a way that does not interfere with their job then that speech is protected by the first amendment and those are those are big ifs and you can sort of see how it, it actually does tales and interplays a little bit with the Hatch Act because those caveats, it needs to be as a private citizen um, and it needs to not interfere with your job, very much sort of align with the idea of you need to do this outside of work and on your own time and as a private citizen. Um, but that's the rule of thumb. If those three criteria are met, then the speech um, is generally speaking going to be protected by the First Amendment. There are um, some important exceptions and and again this is this is sort of the 10,000 foot view but the, the most important one for scientists I think uh, in the you know, really immediate way to be aware of is that uh, classified information is not going to be protected uh, if you're dealing with classified information you're sort of in a whole different ball game and uh, you're not necessarily going to uh, be allowed to speak publicly about that kind of information and be protected by the first amendment when you do it. Um, also, if you are a scientist who is considered a high-level employee, and there's a lot that goes into determining who that is, um, and so again, you know, if you have a specific question and you're trying to determine in your particular situation, if that's you, please give us a ring. Uh, don't don't hesitate. Um, but if if you are considered a high-level employee, then it's also the case that your speech may not be protected by the First Amendment. So to say, you know, there there are some notable and important exceptions, but that's the rule of thumb. Um, so I, I, I keep saying, you know, the speech will be protected. Uh, what exactly does that mean? And what it means is that your government employer cannot um, retaliate against you, take a negative personnel action against you because of your speech. So you can't, because of your speech, be fired, demoted, suspended, you know, reassigned, moved around, have the, the terms of your employment significantly changed. Um, and courts have, you know, in a lot of cases, although not totally universally, but in a lot of cases, interpreted this quite broadly to just say, you know, any other action that would deter a reasonable person from speaking. Um, your employer cannot do that to you because of your speech. Um, that because of your speech aspect of this is a pretty important part of it. Um, there needs to be a demonstrable link there. The speech itself that, that was protected must be the substantial or motivating factor behind the adverse action that's been taken against the employee in order for, for this all to be triggered. So that's a you know that's a rough sketch uh, of how the First Amendment may play into a scientist's ability to um, venture into the political arena as a private citizen. Um, and what I wanted to do now is sort of just run through a few uh, what I would call kind of personal uh, or, or sorry uh, frequently asked questions. Um, you know, things that seem to come up quite frequently for scientists that we find that they are wondering. And the first one is, uh, can I make a political donation or contribution to, to a campaign, uh, a partisan campaign or a political party? Um, and the answer is, generally speaking, yes, you absolutely may. Um, even as a federal employee, you absolutely may do that out of your personal funds. Um, 
so one thing to to note or just highlight for people who are thinking about this is that a donation or a contribution a political donation can take a lot of forms there's you know there's your sort of very standard what we think about oh i you know i sent a check to to that campaign or you know to the rnc or whatever it might be um that is one that's probably the most common, but there are various other things you can do that would be considered a political donation. Um, so if you're providing goods or services to uh, a campaign or a political group um, for free or for reduced costs, that can constitute a, a, a political contribution. Same for if you pay money to attend an event or a fundraiser, or if you buy campaign merchandise from a campaign website, those are all things that can be considered a, a political contribution. So that's that's good to keep in mind, um, particularly as I move into the, the next part of what I wanted to say on this topic, which is, okay, what if I am a scientist who's not a um, federal employee or a government employee? I don't, you know, I don't just get a traditional paycheck from the federal government, but I, I'm employed by some other institution and I get federal grant funds. Um, and in some instances, and I, my understanding is actually in quite a number of instances, uh, there are scientists who that's, you know, that's the that is the bulk or even the entirety of their funding and that's where their salary comes from, even though they are um, technically at some other institution. Um, so if that is the case, um, you're a scientist who's received a, a grant, um, probably the most important thing to know is that federal money you have received that way that was specifically designated uh, as salary for you, that is, you know, once it's once it's come that way and it's in your, you know, your personal account as personal funds, it is generally speaking going to lose its identity as federal money and you absolutely can use that money then as your personal money to make a donation to a campaign or attend a fundraiser or whatever you might want to do as a private citizen. Um, the flip side of that is that federal grant funds and resources acquired with those funds, whatever that might be, computers, what, uh, phones, whatever else, um, that aren't designated specifically for personal salary, but are intended, you know, under the grant to be used for for some other purpose. Um, they need to be used for that purpose, and those funds should not be used um, for political activities like this. And you know, it probably goes without saying, but it's worth it's worth mentioning. It's important to keep that distinction clear for those who are in that situation. Um, the next sort of FAQ that I wanted to talk about a little bit is okay so can, you know to what extent can i um get involved with a political campaign and here too the short answer is if you are a less restricted employee um or if you are a you know not not a federal employee who's not covered by the hatch act and not otherwise subject to its its uh, its requirements then you absolutely have a right you know in both of those cases you absolutely have a right to participate with a political campaign as as long as you do it as a private citizen on your own time um so you can volunteer with the campaign by canvassing, driving voters to the polls, being a poll worker. You can put up a lawn sign at your home. Um, you can wear a button or a sticker um, as long as you don't do it at work. You can circulate a nominating petition for a candidate. Again, you can't circulate it at work, but in your private time and your 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 private world as, a, as an individual citizen, you certainly can. Um, you're allowed to publicly endorse or oppose a candidate. You can make a speech at a rally. You can, you know, take an active part in working with the campaign. You can do all of these things as long as you're doing them um, outside of your, your work space and time and federal authority. Um, so that kind of moves into, touches a little bit on um, the idea of publicly expressing a political uh, opinion. Can I do that? And again, the, the answer is you absolutely can, uh, as long as you are not on the job. 
as long as you're not on duty, as long as you're not in a federal building or vehicle, as long as you're not otherwise exercising your federal authority. And importantly, this does include uh, online. You know, you can, if you're doing it on a personal account, um, you, you certainly can um, make a tweet endorsing or opposing a candidate or expressing a political opinion. Um, if you are a less restricted employee, further restricted employees are subject to some additional limitations there, particularly as far as posting links to um, campaign created content. So if you you are or think you may be a further restricted employee, um, you know, uh, sort of as per usual, you need to tread with a little bit more care here and make sure that, you know, that you understand where the boundaries are. Um, so one important thing to talk about is in the midst of this ongoing pandemic, um, a lot of these things that I'm saying, you know, make sure you don't do it on the job, um, can become a lot more complicated because a lot of us are, are spending a lot more time, um, perhaps all the time, working from home, working remotely. Um, and so the line between I'm, I'm, at home and I'm at work uh, is a lot blurrier for a lot of people than than it typically is. And it's also the case that a lot of political activities that normally would happen, um, you know, sort of in person, um, speeches, rallies, reaching out to voters are, are also happening online. So sort of both working and engaging in, in activism from home in, and from the very same space in, in, in a number of cases uh, in this time that we're in. So how do we, how do we sort of reckon with that? And the, the basic rule of thumb that I would give people is that you are considered on the job or on duty any time that you are performing official duties. So if you're teleworking, you know, any time that you are, you know, sort of officially on duty and performing your job, you should imagine that you are in your office building and sort of treat it that way. Um, even if you're actually on your couch in your living room and you should not engage in partisan political activities during that time. And um, the safest bet is to try to in as much as possible, keep track of the hours when you are performing your job and on duty and being compensated for your work by the government um, and not engage in, in those political activities during those times. Uh, how about joining a political party and voting? Um, this is another one that we've heard, you know, is there anything I need to think about in terms of registering with a party or, or, or how I vote? And the answer is a pretty flat no. Um, one, of the, one of the very first things that the Hatch Act says is that this is not intended to affect the ability of federal employees who are U.S. citizens to vote as they choose and to register with a political uh, party. So those are two things that you absolutely may do um, without hesitation. Uh, one quick thing that's worth noting is that if you need to miss work to vote, um, which is you know not actually such an uncommon scenario, um, generally speaking, uh, there's there's nothing, no federal law that 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 allows employees to do that. So. Uh, it, it can be worth checking whether in your particular state, wherever you are, there may in some cases be a state law that allows you to, but very often, um, if you're gonna need to miss work to vote, you you're going to need to request a leave to do it and sort of get that officially on the books. Um, and non-citizens, people who aren't US citizens, of course, um, can't vote, but uh, it's worth noting that they can absolutely still volunteer with the campaign um, for non-fundraising things, and they can use their residences to host non-fundraising events. So there, even in those cases, there's plenty that you still can do. Um, a couple of just really general tips and, and best practices that, in my opinion, apply to 
pretty much all scientists, regardless of whether they are government employees or employed by a university or a private institution. I think this is these are helpful things for everyone to think about um, who's interested in becoming politically active and engaging in some activism um, and at the same time sort of minimizing the chance of any negative blowback or repercussions for them in their professional lives. Um, first is to be sure to engage in those activities using your own funds and resources, um, you know, straight up cash, but also computers, phones, printers, paper, all of that kind of thing. Um, and to do so on your own time. And, and to keep those lines as clear as it's possible, to keep them, especially in our, our current crazy world. Um, and generally speaking, you know, going even further than that, just doing as much as possible to maintain a clean, a clear line between personal and professional, including, you know, keeping records of when you're working and not working in as much as you possibly can, keeping that straight, um, keeping separate your personal and professional email and social media accounts and, and doing the best you can to make sure that you use the professional only for professional and you use the personal for those, those uh, political activities that you want to engage in um, and uh, I mentioned already equipment and also um, you know it's a good idea um, that it, particularly you know if you're if you're out and about if you want to attend a rally or give an interview on TV um, to to be sure not to wear uh, your employer's logo insignia uniform while you're doing it that it, it may sound like a no-brainer but um, it'll be really helpful in making it very clear that you're engaging in this activity as a private citizen and not on behalf of your employer um, and on that on that note um, in generally speaking uh, it can be really helpful if you are giving um, some kind of statement either verbally or written to Think about using disclaimers to, to make it explicit that you are speaking in your personal capacity or writing in your personal capacity. Um, if, if your employer does need to be identified um, as sort of part, part of your bio for whatever it is that you're doing, and I've seen scientists face this situation, um, it can be really helpful to include a disclaimer saying this is for identification purposes only and doesn't represent you know, the views of the employer or something similar to that. Um, and it's always, you know, just a great idea if you if you're going to, um, you know, dive into this realm to to take some time to make sure that you've taken a look at your institution's specific policies around political speech, whatever they might be, because they probably exist, um, and make sure that you understand uh, what they are. And again. Um, CSLDF, we're very happy to to help um, if there are specific questions about that. Um, I'm running short on time, but I, I'm, I'm going to buzz through this last slide very quickly and then I'm going to open it up for, for any questions that folks have. Um, I just wanted to talk through a couple of pointers if uh, you are a scientist who finds yourself in, in a situation where, you know, there, there somehow have been negative repercussions and um, something is, you know, something is happening. You're being targeted in, in some way, either internally or externally because of um, activity you've engaged in, speech you've made, etc. cetera. Um, and a couple just top level pointers. It is important in that situation to remember that any institutional council, whoever they are, you know, agency council, university council, um, they can be a great resource. They can be really helpful. And I don't mean to suggest that they are bad and sh that you should not talk to them necessarily, but it's really important to keep in mind that they are not your lawyer. They are the institution's lawyer. They, they represent the institution's interests and not yours. And those may not necessarily always be the same thing. Um, if you're facing some kind of internal retaliation, um, take some time, and again, please call us to understand what the internal channels are um, that are available to you for um, responding, for filing complaints, and what the implications of using them are. Um, taking a pause and making sure you've done that survey can be really, really important and helpful. And last but not least, if what is happening is external, 
um, if you're if you're getting um, you know hostile messages or facing you know uh, facing targeting from you know an outside interest group um, something like that um, first tip is that sometimes the best thing to do is to ignore it. Um, there are cases where that's really the best way to go, even though that may not necessarily feel like uh, the most satisfying thing. Um, that said, if what we're talking about is a congressional inquiry or a subpoena, a records request, some other, you know, sort of really formal thing like that, or if you're getting, you know, messages that are physically threatening, and um, that is a list of things that should never be ignored. And um, in that that circumstance, you know, yet again, please do contact us or another lawyer because um, that's a case where you really want that advice. Uh, so I'm going to wrap it up here. I wanted to, to just extremely briefly mention that some of the content of what I've been talking about is contained in some of the various resources we've created for scientists, and they're all available uh, for download on our website for free so you know just a just a little pitch here for that please don't hesitate to go take a look and, and grab some of them because uh, it reiterates some of these things and more and they cover you know a variety of topics as you can see here so those are available and last but not least that is my contact information for anybody who wishes to reach out and i will be very glad to to turn to some questions all right Thank you so much, Augusta. This is always a really useful presentation, I think, for all scientists to see. And you had a lot of great info in here. Um, for everyone still with us, we will send out a recording of the webinar as well as a link to the slide deck. So for some of those slides that were um, text heavy that Augusta mentioned that um, she wasn't going to read every word of it for you all, um, you will have that in your hands soon. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention a couple of upcoming events that we're having. So um, CSLDF will be back with us on um, October 13th for another webinar to talk about, um, about science and advocacy. So to, to figure out in congressional powers so you can learn more about um, reaching out to your members of Congress um, through that, and then we'll, we're also gonna be sponsoring a um, woman scientist forum by a group called Sisters Lead, Sisters Vote, um, and they are focused on um, pursuing issues that specifically affect black women. Um, so that will be, I think, a really good panel of scientists. That's gonna be October um, 14th or 15th. They're still finalizing the date for that, but please do follow us on Twitter AGU Science Policy account is um, is AGU Sci Policy, so you can find us there for more information on these. Um, so we will turn to questions now. We had a couple questions come in the chat box during the webinar, and then we'll get to some of the questions that you all sent in. So um, I have two questions for Augusta, and then one that um, I can take. So Augusta, the question here is. Um, is can a federal employee have a lawn sign for a candidate? The answer to that one, as long as what we're talking about is a lawn sign at your your home and and not in in your workplace, um, absolutely yes. Um, yeah, that's that's the divide. You couldn't have that sign up in your office in a federal building, um, but at your home, yes, absolutely. Awesome. Um, next question is, um, do uh, any of um, these issues with getting involved in um, political campaigning or fundraising apply to your spouse if you are a federal employee? Not to my knowledge, no. If, if your spouse if you are a federal employee and your spouse is not, um, your spouse is not going to be regulated or governed by the Hatch Act and doesn't have to worry about any of these requirements as long as you know they're they're not sort of somehow bleeding over into your workspace. Awesome. Um, the next question here is. Are there any groups specifically looking <clears throat> for scientists to participate in campaign related activities? So uh, 
we have a couple of groups we can mention that um, that offer resources for scientists to reach out to candidates. So um, AGU's voting initiative is um, Science Votes the Future, and uh, my colleague Liz Landau is going to be is going to be pasting a lot of this information either into the chat or into the um, question boxes. So Science Votes the Future, we have resources for you to engage with your candidates, so you can find the candidates that you're interested in um, and engaging with and reach out to them and we'll have talking points and resources for you there. Um, EGU is an earth and space science society. So a lot of what we do is uh, we we also do a lot of like climate science and earth science. Um, but if there are folks on here who are more um, in the medical field, um, Research America is a, is a medical association and their voting initiative is called Vote Science Strong. So they have lots of fact sheets on different medical issues and resources for scientists to get involved um, in campaigns with candidates there. Um, the Union of Concerned Scientists um, also has a voting initiative called Science Rising. Um, they focus a lot on scientific integrity issues. So if that's more your nature, your wheelhouse, you can get involved with them um, there. So I hope that answers your question, but not I apologize. I don't have a more concrete answer for that. Um, and since that was all the typed questions that we have, um, I'll go into some of the questions that folks sent in. So someone asked, uh, how can I make a difference and convince people to not vote for the sitting president? Um, our advice for this is to frame these kinds of questions a little bit more neutrally, um, more in terms of wanting someone to support a candidate who supports science versus supporting one specific candidate. Um, and the rule of thumb for these kinds of conversations we feel is is always to sort of get, get a sense for what someone you're speaking to really cares about and try to appeal to someone on those issues that we care about. A thing that we do a lot at AGU is if we're having um, our scientists talk to they were Republican members of Congress about climate change. It's not necessarily talking about climate change. It's talking how, talking to them about how um, rising sea levels are affecting national security because there's lots of military bases that are at risk of being flooded or how extreme weather events are going to impact their constituents or how droughts or wildfires might impact their constituents. So that's what we would recommend for that. So not necessarily trying to say you should vote for this person over this person. It's you should vote for this issue over that issue. And this is the person who cares about this issue that you also care about. Um, next question here is um, how can we best address the opinion that conservative Supreme Court, Supreme Court nominees are more important than um, science or climate change? Um, so again, generally, we want to show someone um, how important acting on the issue of climate change really is. Um, so framing issues of science and climate change and showing how they impact us currently and how they'll impact society for decades or centuries to come um, helps to explain how long it takes for um, climate change issues to take uh, to impact us. Um, there's a lot of research on like the psychology of climate change and how we don't care about things that we can't see immediately. Um, so it helps to sort of to sort of frame things. And this is a really long-term issue that we need to care about and should care about for a long time. Um, but we need to act now, um, or we don't we won't have time to act in the future if we don't act now. Um, another question. How to deal with a climate science denying colleague in my geology department. So our recommendation here is if your colleague is a scientist to try to talk to talk through the science with them. Again, this is sort of meeting people where they are and trying to appeal to the things that they care about. Um, this can be difficult though because uh, a lot of us can be sort of entrenched in our opinions and in our views. Um, but there are websites like Skeptical Science to try to find good counter arguments um, 
to sort of come come to these folks with some claims. Um, okay, next question here. We've got about three minutes left. Um, how do you find the fine line where scientists can fully advocate for science without compromising the neutrality of science? Um, something that we like to say here is um, wearing your scientist hat and wearing your citizen advocate hat. So um, making it clear to whoever you're speaking to which hat you're wearing, and that makes it easier to share information about science and to advocate for the positions that you want without sort of muddying the water. Um, as a scientist, you're allowed to be a human with opinions. It's just important to be clear about um, when you're strictly sharing your science versus when you're advocating for a position that you believe in. Um, and again, I think this, we talk about this a lot when we bring um, some of our scientists to meet with their lawmakers on Capitol Hill that, um, it's unfortunate that science has become a partisan issue, but this is the world that we live in and making sure that you are talking about the facts of your science and how they can impact everyone and versus how it impacts the political party. This one is pretty tricky. Like I said, it's, it's unfortunate that science has become a politicized issue, but, um, yeah, we, we wish you luck in this. It's, it's not always easy. Um, and the last question here in our last couple minutes, um, what are the most effective means by which to get climate deniers, especially politicians, to listen to the science? So I touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, making sure that you understand what um, someone or a politician really, specifically a politician, really cares about. So figuring out um, how you can get to, like I said, talking about issues of flooding or extreme weather or wildfires and how this is impacting their constituents. Um, something that we talk about a lot is um, these politicians recognize that these changes are happening to their environments around them and people in these um, people in these uh, in states where they have climate denying politicians are still having droughts, they're still having wildfires, they're they're still seeing this impact these communities. So it's it's talking about not climate change but drought, not climate change, but wildfires or, or hurricanes or whatever it is. So so talking about it in something that is is tangible and that they can see versus climate change as a whole concept. Um, Okay, so that was all of our questions. Um, as I said again, you will all be emailed a recording of this presentation as well as the slide deck. And um, Augusta's information is here. If you have more specific questions, um, we're happy to answer any of those questions at AGU as well. So um, thank you all so much, everyone, um, for joining us. And we hope you have a great rest of your day and that you feel more empowered to advocate for science.